60 years ago, Britain was home to the greatest show on earth. Every September, thousands of people would flock to Farnborough in Hampshire and spend the day gazing skyward. What they saw, scorching through the air, were astonishing machines flying at incredible speeds and all powered by what seemed to be a technology from the future. That technology was a British invention and it would signal the dawn of a new age the jet age. The noise and the speed, I mean, for a small boy, heaven, absolute heaven. Britain had a world-class, world-beating aviation industry. Those crowds at Farnborough weren't just plane spotting. They believed they were looking at their country's future. <laughs> the jet age was expanding at almost an alarming rate. It was a very exciting time. You could climb at 4,000 feet a minute happily. You could dive down at six, 8,000 feet a minute. Within minutes, you were 50 miles away or 100 miles away from your base. It was suddenly a new world. The jet engine was a lucrative export, and wartime allies were queuing up to buy it. It was also a powerful piece of military hardware. And in the Cold War, old friends were now enemies. Britain now faced a huge dilemma. The jet engine held out hope for economic revival for a nation bankrupt by war. But selling it could alter the balance of power in the new world order. The country had to decide how best to exploit this new expertise. Knowing the wrong choice could prove disastrous. On the night of the 14th of November, 1940, the Luftwaffe struck Coventry. Those planes brought down fire and destruction to virtually the whole city centre. Along with 4,000 homes and three quarters of the city's factories, this place, Coventry's medieval cathedral, was left in utter ruins. It was the single worst raid of the entire Blitz, but few of Britain's cities were left unscathed. The damage to the nation wasn't just physical. The war effort meant Britain's finances had also been hit hard. By 1945, the country was heavily in debt and it would take years to pay off. There's a perceived wisdom that life here after the war was all about austerity, but in truth, it wasn't quite as bad as that. Yes, the country has suffered during the Blitz. This place is evidence of that. Yes, Britain was horribly in debt. And it's true there was still rationing. But the point is, unlike Europe, everything here still worked. The roads, the railways, the ports. Britain's factories were still churning out items of every description. And what Britain was doing most, and with some brilliance, was building aircraft. In the minds of her leaders, Air power had saved Britain in 1940 and had been crucial for victory in 1945. During the war, the nation's myriad aircraft manufacturers, companies like Supermarine, Avro and Vickers, had built a staggering 131,500 aircraft. By 1944, more Britons were building aircraft than were serving in the army. And come peacetime, it was believed that industry would be the country's salvation. New airfields, new aircraft factories, uh, new arms factories, all these things were being built 
um, because this is where the future was thought uh, to be. So Britain was at least as much as a warfare state as it was a, a welfare state. They were trying to build not just a new Jerusalem, but a new Sparta as well. Britain may have looked tired and drab on the ground, but in the air it was a very different matter. Hurtling over her skies were ultra-modern and very fast aircraft of futuristic shapes and designs. The country's genius at building jet aeroplanes was unrivaled. Records for speed, altitude and distance tumbled. Now for the run over the record mile. Watch out for the delayed action sound. The plane's way ahead before your eardrums catch up with it. The first four-jet airliner made worldwide news by its astonishing flight to North Africa and back. I mean, the big thing about the jet engine was that it completely changed the game. Speeds went up from a maximum of about 400 miles an hour. Suddenly, they were up to 700 miles an hour and beyond. And you're, you're really pushing the envelope. In the post-war world, the jet was a symbol of technological and scientific power. It could bring wealth, prestige and security. Britain's future would lean heavily on its aviation industry. Despite having lost a third of our wealth and all the rest of it and the shabbiness, there was this shimmering promise and technology was absolutely central to it. It was powerful magic. But that magic had darker uses. The jet engine was changing the world, but the world was also altering fast. This was the time of the Cold War. Gone were the old certainties. The empire was crumbling, and two new superpowers were emerging. Britain now had to fight for its place on the world stage. To the British aircraft industry, the turbine jet had brought a golden opportunity. In this new form of air travel, Britain has the chance to make up the leeway lost in the war. The man widely regarded as the inventor of the jet engine was Frank Whittle. Years before the Second World War started, the young RAF cadet had been working on an idea that would change the world. This is the turbine jet. Air and fuel ignited in combustion chambers. Now, in the path of the rushing gas, insert a bladed wheel, a turbine. Link the turbine to a powerful fan. Under fierce compression, the temperature rises, and the expanding gas roars from the jet pipe with tremendous force. When they start it up, stand back. Its flaming breath is white-hot gas. By the start of war, Whittle had proved the viability of a new, more powerful type of engine. The next step was to find out if it could fly. What I've got in front of me here is the original specification for the first ever British jet. Now, you would have thought that they would have given this a, a, a kind of a name to reflect the excitement of the project, but with, I suppose, typical British understatement, this is called the E2839. It's experimental order number 28, drawn up in 1939, hence the E2839. Britain's first jet was soon ready for its maiden flight. It was 1941 when the sound of a turbojet was heard over English fields. It was just an easy airplane to fly, but for its size and time, startling performance. It pointed the way as a first what Aladdin's cave lay ahead of us if we pursued this. The success of the E-2839 signalled a bright future, but this was just a prototype. What was needed was something faster. See how 
down the Gloucester Meteor descent in front of the E2839. It's got the same kind of fuselage and the same short, stubby wings. But this was no experimental aircraft. This was a fully functioning, operational fighter jet. Fast, powerful, armed with cannons with a rapid rate of climb. And you can hear the sound of those twin engines, the power and potential of those. This came into service in 1944. That's still wartime. It's the age of Spitfires, the Fokker Wolves and Mustangs. But when people heard those engines for the first time, what they were listening to was the sound of the future. I began to hear more and more about them as I got into the test flying world. Anticipation certainly was at a very high level. When it happened, I was not disappointed. The RAF flew the first squirt planes ever to go into action against the enemy. The squirts have plenty of power, and if you open up the throttle suddenly, you get a kick in the back from your seat. I heard the whistling noise. When it got overhead, I noticed there wasn't a propeller. So I downed tools and ran in the house to tell everybody I'd seen an aeroplane without a propeller. Of course, nobody believed me. else and long distances, extreme heights, the world was your oyster. Air forces around the world were queuing up to buy this fighter, but for those learning to fly it, it could prove a killer. To put its pilots through their paces, the RAF would teach the art of asymmetric flying, staying airborne using just one engine. On a propeller-driven plane, this was tricky. On a meteor, it could be deadly. It's the position of the engines out there on the wing that was a problem. It's where the propellers would have been. But the thrust on a turbojet was so powerful that if one engine failed, it made the aircraft very difficult to handle. The scene of devastation in the Sussex village shows the tragic aftermath of the crash of an RAF meteor jet. Reports say that the aircraft first hit a bungalow, then one of its tanks exploded, and the blazing fuel added to the havoc. By the early 50s, the RAF was losing a pilot almost every other day. The Meteor became known as the Meat Box. But the appalling death rate didn't diminish the number of recruits willing to fly the jet. Britain's laboratories and factories and airfields, the whistle of the jet is spreading all around the globe. In 1952, as Cold War tensions intensified, the RAF reached its post-war operational peak almost 10 times the size it is today. To make life safer for cadets, a new jet plane was developed, with the engine buried in the fuselage. This is a jet provost. Its prime role for the RAF was as a jet trainer, a task it performed for over 35 years. It's a wonderful example of pure 1950s jet technology. More importantly for me, it's got two seats, which means it can take a passenger. To say that I'm excited is something of an understatement. The pilot on my Top Gun experience is John Corley of the Classic Air Force. It's a wonderful smell of oil and metal. It feels like, a, like an old jet, it really does. It fills the part. It's quite a palaver, isn't it? It is, but this is your parachute. It's worth it. <laughs> and the noise of the engines rising. 
but you can only imagine what one of those trainee pilots must have felt like getting in one of these for the first time in the 1950s. Absolutely, this would have been the first aircraft they'd ever flown in. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Oh, that's really amazing. We're absolutely hurtling towards the airfield. What a lovely fly pass. Slow and quick straight over. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when you joined the RAF and uh, as a young pilot, you, you joined knowing that, you know, at least one or two on your course weren't going to make it. And yet, you've only got to be in this plane now, haven't you? And realise why so many people wanted to do it. It's so exhilarating and, it's, and you get such an amazing view of the world, don't you? It's not a bad office window to look out of, is it? No. Okay, we're all clear. So I'm looking straight down at the sea. The horizon swiveling. <laughs> ah, that's just so much fun. <laughs> Over we go. Right towards the ground. I'm all with level. Wow, that is maneuverable. Whenever there's an image that sort of typifies the jet age of the 1940s and 50s, it's, it's that silver colour, isn't it, of the rondel. Isn't that beautiful? Good. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. By the early 50s, the Cold War was driving Britain's defence spending to a staggering 10% of the national budget. For a nation heavily in debt, cash was still in short supply. But the country's jet industry came to the rescue. This is the Vampire, one of Britain's early jet fighters. It's got a twin boom. Remarkably, the entire cockpit is made of wood. This plane was operating at the end of the Second World War, but I think it still looks incredibly futuristic. The Vampire was a huge success. Over 3,000 were built, and they were sold to more than 30 different air forces all around the world. With the Cold War rapidly escalating, the world was now looking to jet technology to defend itself. And for buyers, that meant attending aviation's biggest stage, the Farnborough Air Show. At Farnborough Aerodrome, the Society of British Aircraft Constructors have proved once again that their inventive genius is second to none. And the great variety of aircraft and equipment, together with thrilling performances by famous test pilots, aroused the keenest interest from foreign visitors. You could see examples of every Air Force uniform in the world. They came to see what the British had to offer. And we had a lot to offer. Farnborough was the country's shop window, and everyone who came, came to buy British. Britain was clearly in the lead uh, in the development of jet engines. It's the major exporter of jet fighters to the air forces that are re-establishing themselves in, in Europe, the Swiss, the Swedish, the French. It is, it is really quite extraordinary the extent to which they dominate that market and, uh, and essentially wipe the floor with American competition. The nation's post-war economy was now investing heavily in aviation. 
more than a quarter of a million Brits were building engines and planes. The jet had become big business. The Gloucester Ground Attacker, a 24 rocket meteor nicknamed the Reaper, the machine is a fast, hard hitting, close support fighter bomber, one of the best flying today. I suppose the Cold War and the aviation industry drove each other. One was driving the other all the time. It was intensifying every year, becoming bigger and bigger, and we were showing more and more interest, and more and more new stuff was coming onto the market. The Hawker P-1081 is a fighter that goes like grease lightning. The Vickers 535 is another. What's that? Even faster? Oh, well, your guess is as good as mine. The Cold War was the most intense pacemaker. And we Brits thought that we had to be in the vanguard. We couldn't just buy things off the shelf. It's part of a sense of national sovereignty. What sold such planes was seeing them flown in the most daring and entertaining fashion. So what you'd get would be barnstorming displays. Pilots thundering past at 50 feet off the deck, doing vertical climbs, barrel rolls. And often, crowds were seeing prototypes for the first time. Take a look at the Hawker P-1067. No details, I'm afraid, but it may be the world's fastest fighter. Britain dominated the marketplace, but the nation's need to sell its jet know-how had a far bigger impact on the Cold War. In a world now divided between communist East and capitalist West, Britain found itself dazzled by the headlights of dilemma. On the one hand, its economical necessities. On the other, its ideological principles. And principles didn't always win out. It's a little known story, but with the urgent need for cash, the post-war Labour government decided to sell some of Britain's secret technology. It was a bit like selling the family silver to pay for the mortgage, and part of that silver was its jet engines. One of the largest potential customers for British jet hardware was the Soviet Union. The country had been ravaged by the war, it wasn't only Britain facing economic hardship. The Soviets realized they had to defend themselves against the ferocious military power of the US. Glancing down the list of British hardware, they asked for some meteors, some vampires, and some of these, the Rolls-Royce Neen turbojet engine. They clearly knew they were chancing their arm, as Stalin is supposed to have said, what fool would sell us his secrets? The request appalled Britain's military chiefs and divided the government. How mad are we, exclaimed the Foreign Secretary, to even consider it. But the British government was convinced their engineers would always be one step ahead of anything sold abroad, especially a turbojet engine reverse engineered by poorly trained Soviets. So despite the risks, the cash-strapped government agreed to the deal with one proviso. They were to be used only for civilian purposes. It was to be a disastrous decision. Tensions between East and West were already becoming strained. And before long, the sales of these engines would impact on a conflict for thousands of miles away in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, there comes open aggression in Korea. Yeah, in May 1950, the Cold War turned hot as North Korean forces invaded their southern neighbors. Less than a month later, the United Nations were at war with the communists. An American base somewhere in South Korea prepares for another attack on the Reds by jet fighter bombers. Did I have any thoughts about fighting communists? I don't think so, quite honestly. I didn't. Uh... Um, I think I can honestly say, first and foremost, it was something that I'd been trained to do, OK? I was going to poop rockets, I was going to fire guns, etc. At the start of the conflict, the West's jet fighters and bombers roamed the North Korean skies at will. But a new aircraft soon showed up 
and it outclassed everything. The Russian-built Mikhail Gurievich, better known as the MiG-15. I looked down below and saw an F-80 shooting star uh, going like a bat out of hell, closely followed by a couple of MiG-15s. The other pilot and I said, well, let's go for the buggers, you know. So we opened up the taps and went chasing after these uh, MiGs. And so I pooped the rockets off and they went right, <laughs> right between the two MiGs. <laughs> I remember. Them. And I thought that was pretty good for range, but this guy went that way and this guy went this way. This guy I went after, we just opened up the tax and zoomed up and was out of the way. I never saw him anymore, of course. The MiG-15 was at least 100 miles an hour faster than any aircraft the UK or US possessed. And that was down to three things. With no ejection seat, it was light. It had swept back wings. But the third reason was it was powered by a British engine. So much for the promise of keeping it for civilian purposes. As far as the MiG was concerned, we knew that the aircraft had uh, the Neen engine in it, uh, which had been sold by Rolls-Royce to Russia. The MiG could outturn, outclimb, outzoom, outaccelerate. It went very, very fast, very quickly. The MiG-15 became one of the most successful fighters ever flown. More have been built than any other military or civil jet aircraft. So ironically, production of Soviet copies of the Neen engine far outstripped the Rolls-Royce original. To maintain its influence in the world, Britain had to stand shoulder to shoulder with the US. In the escalating arms race, this policy didn't come cheap. The UK was spending vast amounts on its military, not only to defend itself against the Soviet threat, but also to be the ally of America. But in 1950, Britain still had huge debts. Tea, bacon and sugar were all rationed. Just the year before, the pound had been devalued to encourage cheaper exports. The need for foreign currency was paramount. Aviation and the jet engine was still Britain's best bet for a brighter, safer future. One plane beyond all others offered the country that opportunity. When the Comet appeared at the Farnborough Air Show in 1949, it was a sensation. It represents the first of a new generation of jet airliners and holds promise of a briefer, smoother passage for the air traveler of tomorrow. Even the royal family's first jet experience was in a comet. The plane was fast becoming the jewel in the crown of British aviation. We were pretty battered well into the 50s, certainly in the, in the cities. I mean, the bomb sites were very familiar in London and everything needed a lick of paint. And yet, if you, if you did catch the sight of a meteor, or the comet, shimmering. And it was a remarkable juxtaposition. And 53 was the apogee of all this, because here was this beautiful young queen being crowned. Everest had been climbed by a Commonwealth expedition just on time. There was a perfect conjunction. But also, we did hold the airspeed record. We were absolutely in advance in so many technical areas. And looking back, I, I'm sure we felt it, quite sure I certainly did, that we were members of a success story nation. The Comet could fly higher and faster than any other airliner, and by some margin. Journey times halved, 
It shrank the world. This record-breaking aircraft had again made the front pages by going into regular service as the world's first passenger-carrying jet airline. But more than that, the Americans had nothing like it on the drawing board, let alone in production. If Britain could sell the Comet globally, it would guarantee the demand for spares, for maintenance, for orders of new engines and possibly whole fleets of planes. The Comet put Britain years ahead of the rest of the world and gave them a golden opportunity to corner the market for a generation. By 1953, de Havilland had firm orders for 50 Comets and was negotiating for 100 more. Success seemed assured. But there was a catch. This may have been a civil aircraft, but in the Cold War, every new technology had a dual purpose. If the Comet could travel faster and further than anything before, then the same could be applied to a bomber. In the year the Comet first flew, the Soviet Union successfully tested their atomic bomb. But they had no plane capable of delivering it any further than Paris or London. If the Soviets got hold of a comet, they could steal its secrets and build a bomber capable of reaching the United States. The Americans now tried to stop the sale of Britain's latest jet technology to any country. The British were outraged. There was far too much riding on the latest generation of comets for that. But the government did offer some provisos. One, no comets would be allowed to fly over the Soviet bloc. Two, all maintenance had to be done by British engineers. Three, all spares had to be carried by British ships and held in British buildings when abroad. The Americans were having none of it. Memories of the sale of Rolls-Royce engines to the Soviets echoed in the halls of Congress. Once again, Britain found itself caught between its economic necessity and American anti-communism. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. The British government felt America's ideological hardline masked its true intent to dominate the jet technology market themselves. There was a simple choice. On the one hand, Britain could accept America's demands and wave goodbye to the stunning lead they held in jet transport and all the wealth and prestige that offered. On the other, they could sell the comets, risk them falling into Soviet hands and jeopardize the friendship with the United States. So what to do? On the 11th of November, 1953, the government decided to give the proverbial two-fingered salute to the United States. Commerce would trump security. Unless you were in the Soviet bloc, you could buy a comet. The Americans were furious, but a cruel twist of fate would save Britain from the consequences of its decision. This Mark I comet was the last to roll off the production line. Just months after it entered service, it was grounded, along with every other comet in the world. It was with dismay that we learned that the first of the comets had crashed into the Mediterranean off Elba with the loss of 35 lives. The comet's fuselage couldn't cope with the repeated air pressure changes between takeoff and high altitude cruising. This is the tragic scene of the comet disaster near Calcutta. The aircraft carried 37 passengers and a crew of six. All lost their lives. There were other fatal crashes. Sales of the aircraft plummeted. The game was over. And this particular plane? Well, it never took another paying passenger. Now it's a museum piece.
the last remaining Mark I comet. With huge government investment, the plane was eventually redesigned and strengthened. But by then, American manufacturers had developed their own airliner. The Comet was swept from the marketplace. The Comet air disasters meant Britain lost its lead in jet transport, and with it all the riches that had promised. But out of this tragedy there was, I suppose, one small silver lining. The Comet's technology could no longer fall into Soviet hands, and Britain's special relationship with the US was saved. The country now found itself a junior partner in the relationship with its superpower ally. And with it came new responsibilities. Washington knew the Soviets would soon develop the capability of bombing mainland America. US strategy was simple. Strike the USSR first. The task, however, wasn't straightforward. If the Americans wanted to drop a nuclear bomb on Russian cities, there was a significant and dangerous obstacle they had to overcome, namely the Soviet air defences, surface-to-air missiles and interceptor planes. The best way to avoid these was by flying at high altitude or at night, but that meant seeing the target was nigh on impossible. What was needed were reconnaissance flights to take photographs of radar images of the targets, if it then came to a real attack, the bomb aimer could match these photographs and images with what he had on his screen. He no longer had to see the target with his own eyes. This was all well and good, except for the small but not insignificant matter of flying over Soviet territory in the Cold War. But overflights were nothing short of spying and highly provocative. The US Air Force was forbidden from carrying them out. If the Americans couldn't fly over Russia, then maybe someone else could. An ally, perhaps. An ally such as Britain. Initially, the Labour government refused. But when Churchill was re-elected in 1951, he gave the spy missions the green light. Operation Jiu-Jitsu was born. The name Jiu-Jitsu was very secret. I certainly never knew, I never heard of the name until years afterwards. If the operation had gone wrong at the time, there would have been quite an uproar politically. Um, the Russians would have made much of it. In the early 50s, RB-45 Tornado bombers arrived at an airbase in Norfolk. Although these were American planes with American ground crew, the decals were RAF rondels, the crews were British, and the mission was top secret. The planes had been redecorated with RAF rondels and markings for political reasons. The Americans did not want to fly these flights. The RAF had agreed to do it, so if we had gone down, it would have been a British problem. We were invited down by the um, chief intelligence officer who took us into the operations room in Bomber Command and they had a map on the wall which they uncovered for us and there were the three routes and uh, we were asked to choose one. <laughs> the route arced down through southern Russia to the Ukraine, to the industrial complexes there. It was the longest route and probably had the most difficult targets. So we chose that to do that one. Rex Sanders was one of Jiu-Jitsu's navigators, responsible for taking hundreds of radar images of Russian targets. You are guiding the aircraft, basically using radar, until you get to, to the Russian border, and then you start on your photography. We did over 20 targets, each one requiring about a 50 or 60 mile run into it. 
and you went from one target to another. <laughs> there was no let up at all. It was very hard work. There were airfields and factory complexes and things like that. Probably one or two oil fields in. Deep in Soviet territory, Sander's secret mission was rumbled by Russian air defenses. We were well over halfway up in this exercise, and all of a sudden, the aircraft went into a steep bank. I called out what is happening to the skipper, who replied rather rudely that um, we had been um, subject to anti-aircraft fire, the flak, as we called it, um, and he was turning for home. We had instructions before the flight that if we came under fire, we were to come out. The risks of being shot down had become too great. Rex Saunders had flown his last jiu-jitsu mission. I think the mission was successful in the broadest terms. It played um, a large part in the Cold War. It put the Russians on the defensive. They themselves were very upset that we did what we did, and several Air Force chiefs were sacked. Geneva was the appropriate and attractive place chosen for the first Big Four summit conference. By the mid-50s, relations between East and West appeared to be improving. First, the focus was on President Eisenhower, and here our Premier Bulganian of the Soviet Union with Mr. Khrushchev. Sir Anthony Eden came to propose the British plan for peace. Was it too much to hope for the raising of the Iron Curtain and the ending of the Cold War at last? At the Geneva Peace Conference, President Eisenhower proposed an open skies policy. This would mean that any nation could fly over another without fear of being shot down. No one was fooled by this. The Soviets simply didn't have an aircraft capable of flying over the US, as Eisenhower was well aware. In effect, he was trying to get a license to fly spy missions over Russia. Needless to say, Khrushchev politely declined the offer. What Eisenhower and Khrushchev both knew was the US could fly over the Soviet Union any time it liked. The Americans had developed an aircraft that could cruise 13 miles above the Earth at the very edge of space. At that altitude, it was far beyond the reach of anything the Russians could throw at it. The spy plane was known as the U-2. Western overflying Soviet territory was more or less at the game under the existing rules. You are flying with right intercept, you sometimes successful, sometimes not. And you two flight changed all this because it was so high that it was impossible to intercept, technically impossible. Such state-of-the-art technology was invaluable, but the US were wary of using their own pilots. Once again, the RAF were asked to do the Americans' dirty work. To this day, the British government have never admitted their involvement. As a result, the RAF pilots won't talk. So I've come to Arizona to meet the man who trained them, Major General Pat Halloran, of the US Air Force. When they first showed up at our training base in Del Rio, Texas, we were surprised that they, that they were there. We had no idea, those of us in the squadron had no idea that they were even coming. And I'm not sure they knew, because in talking to them, they thought they were coming to America to fly some new exotic fighter airplane. And they saw the U-2, they couldn't believe it, with those big ungainly wings and uh, glider-like appearance. So it was later when we discovered that they were actually being teamed up with the CIA. Working with the CIA, the RAF pilots flew repeated spy missions for almost two years, photographing Soviet Union industrial and military sites. 
And do you think, kind of looking back on it now, was, was, was that a brave decision by the British, do you think? Absolutely. When we did find out, we thought, good heavens, what if one of the Brits had been shot down? Uh, there'd be hell to pay back in, uh, in Parliament, I'm sure, and the Prime Minister would be probably looking for a new job. But uh, we, we thought it was very gutsy of the UK to do that, but we applauded them for doing it. All we know about the individual missions is they used Air Force bases in Turkey, and if the RAF pilots were caught, their cover story was they were employed by the US Meteorological Office. We know those missions took place in around 1958, 1959. But while we don't know the details, we do know when those U-2 overflights came to an abrupt stop. On May the 1st, 1960, Soviet radar defences locked onto a U-2 spy plane. In the end, it wasn't an RAF pilot caught deep inside Soviet territory, but CIA operative Gary Powers. When he was shot out of the sky, it was immediately clear detente between East and West would never materialize. On display in Moscow, what's alleged to be the wreckage of the U-2 spy plane, which Russia claims to have shot down by rocket. Here is Captain Powers. He is to be put on trial, says Mr. Khrushchev. Проходил открытый судебный процесс над американским летчиком шпионом Фрэнсисом Гарри Пауэрсом. Initially, the Americans denied Powers had been spying, but with a high-tech plane full of photographic equipment and with Powers himself to interrogate and parade before the world, it was clear what had been going on. But the incident was more than just bad PR for the USA. It had a far bigger impact. At the 1960 Paris Peace Summit, Khrushchev demanded an apology. None was forthcoming. So the Soviet Premier went home. It was shock because he couldn't understand why. Why they did it. Of course, the American hawks wanted to destroy Detente and have more investment in the military-industrial complex. From my perspective, American hawks won sending Gary Powers on May 1st. Now, even at high altitude, jet aircraft were no longer safe from surface-to-air missiles. But spying from the sky wouldn't stop. Just a day after Gary Powers was convicted of espionage by a Russian court, a new technology was launched, the spy satellite. The role of the jet had to change. As the hope of peace in the Cold War vanished and the UK technological lead was eclipsed, Britain could no longer simply export fighters and pilot spy planes. Now the nation would pin its hopes on the jet bomber. Next time, Britain under threat of annihilation. When we were at height and on our way, you began to think, oh my goodness me, this is for real. Now to stake a claim at the top table of international power, Britain needed its own nuclear deterrent a generation of aircraft able to fly higher, faster and further than ever before were created, all flown by men prepared to risk everything in a third world war, because these new jets were the platform for delivering Armageddon.